Welcome to this segment of the chemistry of beer. In this segment, we will discuss two enzymes, alpha amylase and beta amylase, that are the main ones that are responsible for converting much of the stored carbohydrate in barley seeds into a form that can be used by yeast. To overview what we will discuss, we will first of all briefly touch on malting and mashing. Then we'll talk about some of the molecular properties of starch. Some of this material will be review, but I think that's a good thing because it helps to reinforce important concepts. Then we'll move on to talk about the properties of alpha amylase and beta amylase. Our next topic will be the, talking about sugar transport in yeast. And finally, we'll tie up some loose ends and summarize our discussion. This figure shows a barley seed. In particular, notice that the starchy endosperm takes up most of the seed. During malting, the barley is allowed to germinate for a brief period of time, and this process induces the scutellum and the aleurone layer to secrete various hydrolytic enzymes. During mashing, the malted barley is milled and mixed with warm water. The hydrolytic enzymes, especially alpha and beta amylase, continue to break down the starchy endosperm. To remind ourselves of the molecular properties of starch, we first of all have to start with the building block, which is glucose. As you may recall from the carbohydrate discussion, glucose can exist in a linear form or in two different cyclic forms, which we call pyranose forms, an alpha d pyranose form and a beta d pyranose form. The cyclic or pyranose forms are the result of an intramolecular reaction that forms a hemiacetal. Because the nucleophilic attack of the carbon-5 or C5 hydroxyl on the aldehyde carbon or C1, which is also called the anomeric carbon, because this attack can occur from above or below the plane of this group, there are two possible cyclic forms, the alpha and beta forms. If you look at our diagram, you will see that the beta form has the hydroxyl group in the equatorial position, and the alpha form has the hydroxyl group in the axial position, a mnemonic device to help you remember and distinguish between alpha and beta is batter up for beta, if that helps. It is important to keep in mind that the conversion between the linear form and the cyclic forms is a dynamic process. The equilibrium greatly favors the cyclic forms, and in particular, the beta form. The reason why the beta form predominates is because the C1 hydroxyl experiences less steric hindrance in the equatorial position. However, it's possible to introduce a reagent called Phalanx reagent or Benedict's reagent that will oxidize the aldehyde carbon or, or carbon-1, the, the anomeric carbon. In the process, one of the components of the Phalanx reagent or Benedict's reagent, copper-2 ions, gets reduced to copper-1. So as the glucose aldehyde group is oxidized to a carboxylate, the copper-2 is reduced to copper-1. Copper-1 forms part of an insoluble precipitate that's a red color, and this forms the basis of a qualitative test to detect the presence of a reducing sugar. Recall that glucose molecules can join together in a condensation or dehydration reaction. We refer to the glucose molecules that have been incorporated into a polymer as glucose residues because water has been lost when the two glucose molecules were joined. Below is an example of two glucose molecules condensing to form what we call an alpha 1,4 linkage. The resulting disaccharide is maltose, which you will hear more about during this segment. We call the linkage an alpha 1,4 linkage because the hydroxyl that is attached to one of the glucose molecules is in the alpha position. Remember, batter up beta, therefore alpha is below the plane of the ring. So an 
alpha-1 linkage connects the number one carbon of one glucose with the number four carbon of the other glucose. And it's alpha because the group was in the alpha position prior to the loss of water. Previously, you were introduced to amylose. So here's a reminder of the structure of amylose. It is essentially a linear polymer of glucose residues connected by alpha-1,4 linkages. The number of glucose residues in an amylose polymer is often in the thousands. Now we talked about the fact that glucose is a reducing sugar. And when we connect several glucose residues together to make amylose, we have a reducing end where the number one carbon would still be capable of opening to the aldehyde and therefore still be capable of being oxidized to the carboxylate. And then we have a non-reducing end where we end with the number four carbon and the anomeric carbon is tied up in a glycosidic bond and it is not capable of opening up to be oxidized to the aldehyde. So we refer to that end of amylose as the non-reducing end. Amylopectin, as you may recall, is also a polymer of glucose residues, and these glucose residues are connected predominantly by alpha-1,4 linkages, but they also have alpha-1,6 branch points. The branch points occur every 24 to 30 residues, and the molecular weight of amylopectin can be up to 100 million. If you look at our diagram, you will see that many of the linkages are alpha-1,4, similar to what we saw with amylose, but I'm showing one alpha-1,6 branch point. We connect the number one carbon, which had the hydroxyl group in the alpha position, that's why we call it the alpha-1, to six because it's connected to the six carbon in the chain below, and that forms our alpha-1,6 branch point. So now that we've discussed the properties of amylose and amylopectin, the major components of the starchy endosperm in barley seeds, we are now ready to talk about the enzymes that catalyze hydrolysis reactions involving these two polymers. The two main enzymes, as we said, are alpha amylase and beta amylase. They're going to break down the starchy endosperm in barley seeds and make this stored carbohydrate into a form that the yeast can then use. Both enzymes have a pH optimum of about 5 and a relatively high temperature optimum, 70 degrees and 60 degrees, respectively, for alpha amylase and beta amylase. This explains why the mashing process uses warm water, because they want to have the temperature to matching the optimum temperature of these two enzymes. Alpha amylase is a monomeric enzyme, and what we mean by that, it is made up of one subunit. The subunit has a molecular weight of 45,000. It requires calcium ions for activity, and it randomly catalyzes the hydrolysis of alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages, but not near branch points or at non-reducing ends of amylose or amylopectin. Beta amylase also is a monomeric enzyme. It has a slightly higher molecular weight of 60,000. There are two active site glutamates that are thought to participate as general acid base catalytic residues. Beta amylase catalyzes the hydrolysis of alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages near the non-reducing ends of amylose and amylopectin such that maltose residues are released. Now I realize this is a lot of verbiage and it'll help to have a picture processes in mind. If we look at this diagram, this schematically shows where beta amylase catalyzes hydrolytic cleavages of both amylose and amylopectin and it's trying to convey how alpha amylase catalyzes an internal cleavage and it happens at random. It just does not happen too near to branch points or too near to non-reducing ends. But through the combined reaction of these two enzymes, the relatively long polymers of amylose and amylopectin are broken down into simpler sugars that the yeast can use. Shown in these two figures 
are alpha amylase and beta amylase. In particular, note the calcium ions, which are represented as green spheres that alpha amylase requires, and also note the catalytic glutamates, which are shown in stick form that beta amylase uses as part of its catalytic residues. If you want, you can view and explore these and other structures using the program UCSF Chimera. You can find this program at the indicated URL. Once you've downloaded this program, you can visit the PDB or Protein Data Bank and obtain the codes for these two structures or other proteins that you're interested in, and you can view these structures and manipulate these structures on your home computer, and I strongly encourage you to do so. So let's compare the breakdown of amylose and amylopectin with glycogen breakdown in humans. Our storage form of glucose is called glycogen. It is similar to amylopectin, but the alpha-1,6 branch points occur more frequently, about every 8 to 12 residues. The enzyme glycogen phosphorylase catalyzes the phosphorolysis of alpha-1,4 linkages from the non-reducing ends of glycogen, as indicated in the figure below. We start with glycogen, N residues long, and instead of water, we use HPO4 2 minus, that's inorganic phosphate. So instead of a hydrolysis reaction, we have a phosphorolysis reaction. And what we form is glucose 1-phosphate, and we still have our glycogen, but it's minus a residue. Now this reaction saves an ATP because the glucose 1-phosphate can be converted to glucose 6-phosphate. And this will be clear to you when we have our discussion on glycolysis. But here's the question. Why would this reaction not be helpful to yeast that are relying on sugar from the starchy endosperm of the barley seed? To answer this question, we have to think about transporters in yeast, sugar transporters in yeast. Shown on the left is a glucose transporter. This, the glucose transporter is an integral membrane protein. It facilitates the diffusion of glucose from outside the cell into the cell. However, if the glucose has been phosphorylated, as in glucose 1-phosphate, it is no longer able to pass through the glucose transporter. So if the barley enzymes broke down the amylose and amylopectin in such a way that we formed glucose 1-phosphate, then that sugar that phosphorylated sugar would not be available to the yeast. But free glucose can diffuse into yeast, and importantly, shown on the right, maltose can diffuse into yeast. And this transporter is a little bit different. Notice that along with the maltose coming into the cell, we have a hydrogen ion coming into the cell. This process is called symport. This is a symporter. Once the maltose is inside the yeast, an enzyme called maltase can catalyze the hydrolysis into two glucose molecules. Once the glucose has entered the cell, either as free glucose or as maltose, which is then hydrolyzed by maltase into two glucose molecules, the glucose can then enter glycolysis and ultimately produce the ethanol that we find in beer. So now we're ready to summarize our discussion. There are other hydrolytic enzymes, including a number of proteases, that are important to, in the brewing process, but we decided to focus on the major ones, alpha amylase and beta amylase. Alpha amylase randomly catalyzes the cleavage of alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages, but not near branch points or at non-reducing ends of amylose or amylopectin. Beta amylase catalyzes the hydrolysis of alpha-1,4 glycosidic linkages. These happen at the non-reducing ends, and they happen in such a way that maltose is released from the non-reducing ends. Mashing is done at a temperature and pH that are close to the optimum levels for these two enzymes, and it is through the combined action of these two enzymes that much of the carbohydrate 
in the starchy endosperm is made available to yeast. So that concludes our discussion of alpha amylase and beta amylase. You will see in future segments how all of these concepts come together and you'll appreciate the unified applied biochemistry that is brewing beer.